since our time wise six so we start and hopefully more will trickle in. I'd like to welcome you to today's meeting and appreciate your being here and the input that you give and uh, it's very important to us. So we'll look forward to discussing some important things today. We'd like to start by introducing everyone who is here on the commission. So um, if we could start with the list or with um, Laura on this end. <laughs> we'll let you introduce yourself. We'll come around this way. Okay. Laura Mihalski, for Street Clinic. Steve Peterson, LDS Church Corporate Services. Jason Mathis with the Downtown Alliance. Uh, Don Cusabilo with Golden Zat. Chris Crosswalk, Rescue Mission Salt Lake. Kenneth Channel is happy to meet with Ferguson. Charles and Christian from the Salt Lake Center. Hello, I think we can use the other curtain on also representing the Lieutenant Governor of Spencer Cox. Johnson, Salt Lake City Council. Ben McAdam, Salt Lake County. Mike Brown, Chief of Police, Salt Lake City. Jack Kuskinski, Salt Lake City Mayor. Joe Miller, with the Salt Lake City. Palmer Hollis, co chair. David Lindbaum, Salt Lake City Mayor's Office. Louis C. David Lindbaum, City Mayor. Mark Stransky, GSPA. Let me go, let's try to talk to Eric Beth Murray, let me talk to you in the action. Cameron Fuller, Workforce Services, Thank you. And I think we have some others that may have been on the phone when we started. Are there others that would like to introduce themselves? All right. Uh, with that, we thank you again for being here. Appreciate your help with this uh, commission. And I'd like to turn the time over to our mayor for her Thank you. Uh, uh, I want to start by acknowledging uh, council members Aaron Mendes Hall and Derek Kitchen who joined us today. Much appreciated that you came. Thank you. And to also thank again Gail Miller and Palmer Capolis who are the co-chairs of this commission and really have been keeping us on track and moving forward. Uh, their time and commitment is greatly appreciated, so thank you. Um, I also want to kind of go over this agenda and briefly outline where we are in our site evaluation. Um, I think it's safe to say that we are about to begin the most crucial phase of this entire process. A phase that will require dedication from this commission, honesty to and from the public, courage from our elected officials and community leaders, and most importantly, compassion, so that we may truly transform our future here in Salt Lake City. Today, through the work of Salt Lake County and Collective Impact Group, we have the framework of a new service model for how we will help those experiencing homelessness. As many of you know, this model is based on years of research and comprehensive data. If done right, this service model will fundamentally, fundamentally alter the homeless services landscape in our city. We will move from an unlinked collection of resources and emergency shelters to a very strategic model, which connects the right type and level of services with, with shelter and places the emphasis on public housing. Helping move individuals and families out of homelessness. We also have a unique opportunity to change the physical footprint of homeless services in our community here. Our goal throughout this process has been to create safe spaces, places of dignity for those in need in our city, and most importantly, areas of opportunity where individuals can work to build new paths forward for themselves. It is now time for this city to find locations for two sustainable, safe, and community-sensitive homeless resource centers, which will serve those in need as well as serve as a model for other communities throughout the state of Utah to replicate in the years to come. We must create new physical spaces to implement the new service model. 
The success criteria identified by the new model will help guide others citing decision, as will space needs from an architectural review, environmental requirements, federal review, and of course, community involvement. As of today, no sites have been selected. As you will hear today, this commission and our city government will begin to move forward with an aggressive timetable. Our goal is to have two sites thoroughly reviewed by stakeholders, including the public, for review by the full city council by November 1st. During this meeting, you will hear from David Lipback and Elizabeth Mueller in regarding the process moving forward. Though we are on an accelerated timetable, this process will be very thorough, transparent, and have built-in opportunities for public engagement. Up to five sites will be initially selected through a rigorous scoring process, reviewed by nearly every city department during a standard city review process presented to the public for their review and comment, and then further narrowed by a committee consisting of members of the city council, this commission, and my office. To ensure public input is constructive and well-informed, it will be my administration's top priority during this time to provide residents with full details on the site selection process, why and how the initial sites were selected, full details on this disregarded sites, and most importantly, how resource centers could look and feel on a particular site. Today, you will also hear more about the public engagement process. I know this process will naturally elicit emotion, but I hope the residents of this city display the best of their characters and not the worst. I hope we remember our end goal is to help men, women, and children in our community who are experiencing homelessness. It is also fair to say this process alone will not address every issue that surrounds homelessness. This new model of service and the new centers being built for it are designed to help those who want to, who want to be helped. In order for them to succeed, we want to make sure that we are working with that population to the best of our ability but also working towards bringing others into the fold so that they get the help that they need. Necessary changes in our criminal justice system and adjustments to our law enforcement strategy will continue to move forward as well. To further separate the criminal element from those truly experiencing homelessness and to move drugs out of our neighborhoods. We have also been implementing changes on 500 West in the Rio Grande area to make the neighborhood cleaner and safer, and we will continue to do more. Some of these things that we have done have included upgraded lighting, which was installed a few weeks ago, stepped up patrols, added additional porta potties, which are being used at an immense rate, new fencing, to bring queuing at the road home onto the property and off the street and expanded our clean teams. It has been said, a journey of a thousand miles begins with one step. We certainly have a ways to go and we know this, but we are far from where we began in this process and we are moving forward quickly. Together we will change the look and feel of our city for the better. And your time and your uh, dedication to this process is greatly appreciated. Thank you.
Thank you, Mayor. I appreciate all of that information. I think it's so important for all of us to understand that movement is slow, but it is forward, and that's the important thing. And we're doing a lot of things. Uh, we're focusing right now on these two uh, facilities. And knowing what's going along with that is so important for all of us because we get bombarded with questions about why aren't you moving faster. We're doing the best process that we feel we can. So with that, I'd like to turn time over to Elizabeth Euler to give us a review or a summary of our last meeting and then we'll go on from there. Thank you. Um, following our June meeting, we gave you a briefing of what happened at the public engagement workshops in June, but because the online engagement was still ongoing, we couldn't give you a report of that. We just wanted to give you an update on what happened with that online engagement. As part of the online engagement, it was very similar to the five workshops we held at St. Vinny's and Storm Community Center, Normal Library, and elsewhere. What we did is we asked uh, participants to really um, participate in two activities. One was a modified version of Walk in My Shoes, where we offered um, seven stories of individuals experiencing homelessness, and then we asked the online community to help uh, identify services these individuals might need. And then the second was we had our success criteria and we asked people to say what they felt was from very important to somewhat important to all the way to not important at all. So I just wanted to give you an update of that. We posted this online engagement on two forms. One is the city's platform, Open City Hall, where we post most uh, city subjects that we're looking for public feedback. And the second was actually a detailed uh, Facebook survey. Overall, we received 647 online participants. We brought our total engagement for June uh, up over 1,000 to 1,076. And from on Open City Hall, it was 368 participants, and on Facebook, it was 279. But really, what we found is how similar the online engagement results would, were to what we heard at our workshops, where we met with participants in person. The top three criteria that we heard in the workshops was the same for online engagement. Number one, safety is key for designing new resource centers. Safety not only for those seeking services, but also safety for the surrounding community as well. The second was easy access to services. So we're making sure that the services people need are on site. From um, shelter beds, to having caseworkers on site, meals, um, other partner agencies. And finally, the third was being a excuse me, access to affordable public transportation. We heard that across the community workshops. In fact, originally we didn't have affordable as part of that criteria, but we heard it not only in the public workshops, but also in the online engagement as well. And then finally, on services that people need when they were asked to identify the walk in my shoes exercise. Again, these are very similar things to what we heard at our community workshops. Um, employment opportunities, job training, uh, and increased case management and transportation. So again, while the online engagement continued through the early part of July, we were very, very similar things to what we heard in June. Thank you, Elizabeth. That was very well done. Are there any questions on that part of the process? And then we'll move on to David Litvak for his site selection process review and timeline, which I believe you all have in the front of you. You know what's going on to us. So there, uh, we're also copies made available for the public, so uh, hopefully everyone will be able to get a copy of this as we walk through it. Um, more than happy to um, take questions either as we, as, as we walk through it or um, at the end, so whatever, um, whatever works best for the commission members. So there are a few parts of the process that are laid out in, this, uh, in the process map. And I'm going to focus right now on the top process, the site selection, and, and walk through um, how we see it moving forward. Um, this is really a, a lot of work, culmination of a lot of work to get us to this point where the process has become much more clear 
uh, the public engagement that was done in June, uh, the conversations within city departments understanding uh, the nature of, of the site selection and, and getting acquiring property, uh, as well as conversations with uh, the city council and understanding that process from their perspective as well. So the, the first step uh, will be the identification of potential areas within the city. Taking the criteria that was prioritized, the success criteria that was prioritized by the public during the public engagement phase, taking the federal requirements, we know at some point these resource centers will have federal funding tied to them. So there are certain rules associated with housing and urban development HUD that, uh, that we must follow. Uh, though some of those rules uh, are environmental justice issues. Uh, some of those rules will uh, eliminate certain properties. You can't be on a fault line. Other rules would require certain types of mitigation. So if we look at uh, the Lantern House in Ogden, for example, is near a rail line, and so it required the creation of the wall that was there. Um, so taking and starting with that, as well as the other criteria, we know that one of the populations that will be served uh, within uh, single men and single women uh, homeless community are sex offenders. And so incorporating the, <coughs> the requirements around space, around schools, parks, uh, so incorporate all of that criteria and identifying potential areas within the city that meet that criteria. From that point, we will do a property search to begin to identify specific properties or sites within locations that best meet the criteria. We hope then to identify potential sites by the end of this month. From there, as the mayor discussed, we have an internal review process within the city for develop a development review team, is called, which is all the city departments and divisions of any kind of development that will look at those properties and assess what type of zoning uh, ordinances would apply to those properties. We hope to complete the internal uh, technical review uh, by the first part of September. From there, with the potential sites that meet that criteria that um, are identified, again, with the, the objective criteria from the very start, we will then develop a, a property worksheet for each of those properties that will allow us to identify to all of you how those sites match the criteria. Some of the criteria, for example, at this point, as we look at what was prioritized by the public, for example, access to services. So once we have properties identified, then we will be able to kind of assess the plan. And we will look at a, a marker in terms of what would identify access to services and the feedback that we receive from the public within a couple of blocks, within a half month. And we'll be able to identify that for each site. And the property worksheets uh, will uh, lay that out. On the property worksheets around some of those, the environmental guidelines, the federal guidelines, if there are mitigation issues associated with that property, will be identified within uh, those, those worksheets. And then also within the worksheet, we will be matching how these potential sites meet the service criteria prioritized through collective impact. So the facilities program is then. It's important to recognize that we're really trying to, to blend and merge at this point two sets of criteria. How the resource centers best serve individuals experiencing homelessness and what type of programming and services are being prioritized through collective impact, and what makes a location or a site successful in the community. Okay. So we will be merging those uh, sets of criteria. Uh, voices keeping me on. All right. Uh, you can laugh. It was funny. Come on now. <laughs> Once we have identified those sites and developed the development worksheets and look at those internally within the administration, we will be taking those potential sites to the city council for review. So part of what we would like to do in the next step with 
up to five sites. It's very important to us that we come to the public, that we come to this commission with options. That we don't come to the public, we don't come to the mission with the final two sites. It's important that that's our goal, and that's what we're aiming to, aiming for the two uh, recommended sites, but we want to come with options. In order to come with options, we also want to be sensitive to cost. And so part of the process is also being able to put options down on up to five sites that will in essence kind of hold and, and that help us manage the cost better. That is a process that we would engage our city council with on up to five sites to put option funding down on, again, up to five potential sites. From there, once the options are in place, we would start a review process with the site selection commission and the public. Now, I'm not going to go into the public engagement process uh, Elizabeth's going to cover that in the next agenda item, but you can see uh, below the bottom of the, of the process map some of what we're envisioning with uh, our public engagement process. We envision public engagement occurring during the month of September uh, as we're working through this process and public engagement workshops in October. <clears throat> Taking the feedback and input from the commission, taking the input and feedback from the public, we are forming a subcommittee, and you see it says executive committee, that's my error. We are forming a subcommittee as the mayor um, discussed of the mayor's office, city council, co-chairs of the commission to take that input, take that feedback, and make the recommendation on the two final sites to the city council. That is the, that is the selection process that we envision from this, process, from this point moving forward. A very aggressive timeline. Our goal is to have two sites recommended to the city council by November 1st. We know that is an aggressive timeline, but we also think it is a timeline, a timeline that allows us to move that process forward in a way that uh, allows us collectively to work with the legislature on the next phase of funding and working towards uh, construction. One of the um, components of the site selection process as well that gets a little bit into, uh, into the public engagement is we also envision working with, um, with Nexus, uh, who has done a great job in the process with Salt Lake County and the collective impact process in developing the service criteria. We anticipate that process for the two facilities, two resource centers, being completed by the end of August. We uh, are planning to work with Nexus to help create visuals to engage in the public. From the very beginning, really at the, the, the vision of, of Palmer and Gale, has been said to us very importantly that a part of Citing two resource centers and a part of engaging the public is we need to reimagine what homeless services can look like in our community. And so it's important that taking that service criteria, taking our location criteria in October with the public, that we help that reimagination process. Uh, so that is an important part of our public engagement process as well, um, which Liz will go into more details. I am more than happy to answer any questions. Let me just say that what the development in land use, we understand that there is going to be a land use process through uh, the city uh, and through the city council. We won't know exactly what that looks like until we have sites and property um, identified. So it would depend on whether it needs a rezone, whether it needs a conditional use, uh, but regardless of additional use or rezone, we as an administration view the city council as an important partner with us in this process and, uh, and, and we'll engage with them throughout that entire process regardless of what the land use uh, looks like. Um, so that is a little bit um, left unknown until we're able to identify specific sites. So more than happy to answer any questions. David, I, I have a question about the not an easy thing to do, it's a difficult thing to do, I think. 
beyond Palmer set up the set stage and making a determination about where the shelter goes is a really difficult thing to do. Thank you for that. I think it's a difficult job. Um, I wondered what um, what role you mentioned architectural nexus, what role you you have because I know you work closely with the county. How's the collective impact um, conversation gone and how's that influencing your decisions about where these will be located and what that looks like? That's that's a great question. So um, you know, all of you are, many of you, I should say, are part of a part of collective impact. We know that it's a, it's a great process, and we have an action action plan uh, that has been endorsed by collective impact uh, in concept, uh, and it helps us frame the conversation going forward. Part of the challenge that you all also know with um, citing the two resource facilities is we're also trying to, while we're asking the public to reimagine what this look can look like in our community. We're also, as an entire community, reimagining what homeless services looks like. And so we have to be careful not to make judgments just based on what things look like today. We have to, in our, ourselves, kind of reimagine, right? So, so that affects the services. So that, that's, that's a bit of a challenge that we'll just um, have, to, have to work through. Um, the work that Nexus has, um, has a draft document that has been sent to collective impact that begins to lay out the, uh, the space needs that are required based on the services and the programming that will happen both within the facility and outside, right? So when we talk about, and these are all aligned with the collective impact outcomes. So when we talk about uh, impact on the community, outdoor space and the courtyard becomes a really important part of that conceptual design. We are taking that work from Nexus, and one of our one of our next steps, and, and Gail and Palmer will talk about, about this as, as it relates to the commission's role moving forward, will be to bridge that service criteria that is laid out in the work of Nexus with our location criteria to identify, to help us identify the, um, the most optimal locations, the most optimal sites that will allow us to look at community impact, that will allow us to look at things like conducive to regional drug trade, which is a, a location success criteria, access to transportation, but also uh, a site that allows the, a type of facility to be built that has the right health care, that has the right behavioral health access, that has the right partners like uh, employment uh, partner, DWS, uh, from our standpoint, one of the uh, uh, feedback that we gave with Nexus is we envision a very robust community engagement with our uh, with the new resource centers. And so we think it's important that the city have space within the facilities uh, to have a community land. So we're not reacting to issues as they come up. We're engaged and have our pulse on the, uh, monitoring the community at all. Any other questions? David, we talked a little bit about uh, concern about the criminal element that currently exists, and we've also suggested that the two highest priorities are safety for the recipients as well as safety for the neighborhoods and the site selection. So what is it about the site selection that eliminates the criminal element? <coughs> it's got to be more than just we move to a new place and hope that the criminal element doesn't show up. Is there law enforcement that so one of the one of the issues, uh, and I have to pull out the. And you've all seen this this criteria for success because I always say it the wrong way. So some of the, the question will get us to design and how the facilities themselves are for, to, uh, designed uh, for, for crime prevention through environmental design standards. Set Did I say that right? This? So we know that part of that question will be answered in how the facilities are actually designed. Uh, in a way to um, minimize, uh, prevent criminal activity as much as possible. When it comes to the location criteria, as an example, looking at some of that input that we received from the public around criminal activity and um, uh, access to the, to the regional drug trade, working with our law enforcement, the way that we are trying to measure that in location in identifying sites is access to the freeway. So one of the issues right now with the current location, 
as it goes to the drug trade is access to the freedom and that easy access to the audit offer. And so how do we quantify that? How do we calculate that in location identification is a part of our question of what we're doing. The other aspects that how I would answer that some of the feedback that we've provided through the Nexus process in the program facility study is along with having community liaison space within the new resource centers, we want to leverage the great work that our law enforcement agencies do, has done and is doing in creating the social worker program and our uh, community connection center and making sure that that is also uh, connected to the new resource centers as well as space for law enforcement themselves. And, and when we think about law enforcement being a part of the new resource center, it's not, it's not law enforcement being there as the security necessarily or just the heavy. It's law enforcement being there as a partner with the service providers and a partner with individuals who are experiencing homelessness, which is really the vision that the mayor and the chief of police have around how we as a city and law enforcement in particular interact with individuals who are experiencing homelessness. I'd like to add to this as well, and that is we're working with the state as well on how we address addiction in our state to begin with. Um, you really have to go after the desire to buy drugs as much as you have to go after those who are supplying. And um, I think we have a, are starting to develop a very good working relationship there. And there's potential of some legislation moving forward this winter. Uh, that will help us address addiction in our community and um, come at this from another angle as well, and not just one side of it. Have you got any other questions? And just real quick, David, I think I think as we downsize these uh, these shelters, I think the crime uh, when you have one large shelter it exponentially increases the amount of crime that is able to be in that area. And as you downsize the the other question, one of the things that I think is important is the police presence. Uh, I think we've had success at the family shelter in Midville having a police officer be the resource officer just like the officer in the school. He works with the shelter people, he works with problems. But he also works with the community and with each other. And I think that becomes an important part of that police presence that he can uh, lay us on for communication with people who are trying to live there safely, the people who are in the community, and being a spokesperson for people who may be having a problem and how they address that problem, not as a heavy hand that you're arrested, but as a liaison that speaks to the community and to the residents. And that's, I think that's important. Um, I think you need one or two people that are there all the time just like to let, lend help and to be checking with the community to find out where the problems are, how can we help to solve them. Thank you. I think that's an important part of the process is in this reimagining is to not see things as they are, but look for a better way to do things and see them as they could be. Please. Yes. Um, sorry, David. I'm, I'm not quite sure if the question fits exactly into this part of the agenda, but I don't see another place to ask it, so I'll go ahead and ask now. Uh, it's a two-part question. As we discuss the public engagement, I continue to hear a uh, the refrain that we're looking at two sites with a maximum capacity of 250 beds, uh, which is twice the capacity of what shelters in, say, Chicago are allowed. Um, is that is that part of the public process? Is the city open to looking at uh, more manageable sizes? So that's the first part of the question. And then the second part of the question is, let's say that, that the 250 bed uh, number makes it through this process you know, unchanged, which I think would be unfortunate. But it, let's say it makes it through the process unchanged. Uh, that we have two sites, 250 each, 500 new beds, uh, emergency shelter beds, and we have a, um, 
the current road home site, which has no clear end game. So at one point, we're going to have all three of those emergency shelters open based on the last conversation I've heard uh, with no clear end game. So we'll go from you know 1,100 people to 1,600 people. Um, do you care to comment? I sounded like the media there. Do I dare, do I dare to comment? <laughs> um, so a couple things. So um, you know, we've had this conversation with our city council, and, and I know that the city council is, um, and, and I would like council member Johnson to respond as well, um, that the, the, the city council is interested in having a conversation about the size of the facility. I will say from our standpoint as the administration, so let, me, let me explain where 250 comes from. So I want to, debunk any thought that it was just kind of picked out of the thin air. So, so 250 has been um, discussed throughout this process with the administration. It was a number that was identified through research and looking at other size facilities built over the last 10 years. Um, it is based on looking at what best practices are and also analyzing the community impact. And so that's and, and I would also say that through the surveying of collective impact, there was a broad, there was a wide range. And 250, 225, 250 kind of fell within the middle of some of the range through the surveying of, of, of collective impact. I don't know where, the, in all honesty, I don't know where this conversation goes. And, and, and the city council um, wanting to have this, some of this conversation. As an administration. We feel right now that that's what we've committed to. That's the commitment that we've made to the legislature. When we look at the end game, which is really the, the incorporating this as a part of the collective impact action plan and changing the emphasis of the system from shelter or resource centers to housing. And so we're looking at how do we reduce the as I would say, as Mayor McAdams has stated, in terms of the goals of the Collective Impact Action Plan, part of that goal is reducing the need for resource center beds, for shelter beds, through the emphasis on housing. And the number 500 helps get us there. If we put the right emphasis on housing and put the right type and uh, numbers of, number of housing in the community throughout the county, and we're working with EWS and, and the county and the city to identify what that looks like. Um, 500 beds in, a res in two separate resource centers helps us reach that end game. Um, and so that's kind of where we're starting from in the process. And the second question. In terms of the end game of, of the road home? Having 1,500 beds. So our, our commitment all along from the city is that through this process, we will have two resource centers in Salt Lake City. Again, part of the goal of collective impact in the action plan is the reduction of shelter beds. Through housing, through prevention. Quickly, okay, Christian, and your question again. Yes. From the city council perspective, uh, we've heard that. Um, we're starting, as a city councilman, I'm starting from the premise of we are on board with making a new system work as best as possible. Uh, we're redefining what we're trying to do as a system totally. There are a lot of specific elements like we brought up about how do you um, how do you make 250 bed facilities fit into a neighborhood, right? I don't know that we have the complete answer at this point of working through all the specifics. I know we've talked to uh, the county, we've talked to the administration is very aware of this, we're talking about it and saying, with the redesign of the, of the services, with the redesign of the system, does it change the impact of a facility on a neighborhood? How much so? And what's the right optimal size? We still have to hit the numbers. We have to have enough beds to make sure that we have emergency shelter to get into housing. However, we don't know necessarily at this point exactly what the exact number is. Is it going to be 250 and there's some overflow? Um, what's that going to be? I don't know, honestly, at this point. Um, we're willing to go through the process and talk and hear from you, um, especially as we get to specific sites and concepts, uh, what that actually looks like for our neighborhood. Um, but I don't have the exact answer right now. I know it's part of the discussion, though. Can I just add to that? Yeah, I would just add to that. So, 
Dr. Krishna, I know many in the room are familiar with the recommendations from the collective impact process, but we also ag agree that um, you know, these facilities will be located in Salt Lake City. They'll be operated with funding coming from the state of Utah and Salt Lake County. And so that's uh, a delicate balance that we're, we're looking to maintain. Um, that's where the collective impact process has come in and looked at these facilities from the perspective of how they can operate for the maximum efficiency and effectiveness of the people who are in there. Um, and the site commission is looking at how they integrate into the community, recognizing that the, there's not a bright line between the wellness of the individual and the facility and efficiency and effectiveness and integration in the community. So that's the collaboration. But the collective impact recommendations have been that we do believe that uh, the 250 beds is a workable size. Um, we know what capacity we need to meet in order to continue to operate the system. The focus is on reducing numbers, and that's the, the recommendation that's come forward from the, the county's collective impact process is to focus first on reducing the numbers of connecting people to treatment. Um, and then within, but there will still, there'll still be need for emergency shelter. Uh, and that's where these two facilities at 250, we think, can accommodate that. If, if the community uh, believes that it's better accommodated through three facilities or, or some different number, we can work with that. But we do think that two facilities at 250 can work. Um, as Mayor Vyskupski said, we know that the real answer is better connecting people to treatment. And so the county is, is moving forward with uh, two initiatives, uh, including new funding into treatment, our two paper success initiatives that will help to connect people who are often homeless to treatment that can help to reduce homelessness uh, and get them on the path to self-sufficiency. And then we're putting forward a million dollars in, in one cent funding now that will also connect um, people to treatment. So we know that, that the new system is not a sh an emergency shelter-based system, but it's one where emergency shelter is an emergency resource and the system is focused on connecting individuals to treatment and getting them stable and on the path to self-reliance. Oh, I also wanted to add that um, the, the recommendations that have come forward from the county consultant nexus that are focused on, on these facilities from a service perspective, uh, and they're not focused at this point on community this is the work of this commission and particularly the city. But those recommendations on these and analysis of those facilities from a service perspective are available on, uh, on my website. Uh, Thank you. That commission out there. So we're still anxious to receive public comments. And Thanks for coming. That that oh, Any other questions? Yes, in fact. Yeah, I'll follow up on what Christian <clears throat> brought up, uh, capacity of these shelters. Uh, a, a year to 18 months ago, uh, a number of local stakeholders, uh, government people, uh, took a, a, a trip to Chicago to study how Chicago was handling their homeless shelters. And I heard over and over again when they returned from Chicago, they brought back one message, that you can't have a shelter more than about 150 people or it will have a negative impact on the neighborhood. You showed them 250. Can you tell me how that uh, uh, works, uh, reconciles with what was the information that you brought back from Chicago? You know, I, I personally am not familiar with the Chicago story, but uh, as data had mentioned earlier, um, a bunch of data and many sites across the country were looked at. In a much broader perspective, what we learned was that um, a facility of 250, and, and we have facilities that large in Salt Lake City already, that are functioning at a very high level. Um, that that level is um, something that actually is optimal, especially when you are looking at uh, dollars and trying to make sure that uh, you move forward a different resource model than a shelter. And the collaborative nature of what's going on between the city and the county and, and uh, what we will find once we get our program in place is that uh, this is a, a very different way of doing things when, when you create a resource center versus a shelter. And so I think what you'll find, Pete, is that 
in moving forward, we are going to be extremely mindful of how we create a resource center to make sure it doesn't have the issues we're seeing today. And, and that will not be forgotten in this process. I know there 
their concerns about the county jail and, and what our police department is able to do. I know there are concerns about mental health care coverage down there. I know there are concerns with law enforcement. But um, it's a crisis. It's a crisis like a, a tornado hit or an earthquake or an epidemic happened. And I know you're doing everything you can. I really don't want it to be seen as critical because I'm, I'm not. We're in this together. We're all part of the same team. Um, but it is a crisis down there. And pledge immediate significant resources in addition to the great stuff you already did. I don't want to detract from that because it's significant. All I can say is we acknowledge that for sure and we're continuing to welcome ideas and new ideas that we can support. And, and, and the other thing I say is we are also working very closely with the county uh, around the, the specifics that are happening.
Okay, thank you, Gail. Um, for the, the commissioners uh, specifically, uh, we intend to uh, break into our small group setting uh, next uh, to really discuss a lot of the important work that the county has done in, on the collective impact side. And uh, as most of you know, and many of you uh, as commissioners have attended um, the uh, uh, program facilities study that they have been doing with Nexus, and I understand that a final draft will be done by the end of August. Is that right? The preliminary draft. Okay, the preliminary draft is on online now, but the final draft will be done at the end of August. Um, what we would like to do with our small group setting is take that important information and try, as David said earlier, to really merge it with all the work that we have done on our criteria for site development, as well as what they have done for the programming of services um, for the facilities that we're talking about. So we need to really kind of get that information, uh, see how we can merge and line up for the alignment, uh, see what's missing, uh, add what, what may need to be there, get comments and uh, in, into the process from commissioners. Uh, so that will be one of the first things that we want to do in, in our small group settings. And uh, it will be really important uh, to really thoroughly go through that information uh, so that we can, again, merge that with our site selection process. Uh, secondly, and we haven't decided yet uh, we'll, whether we do this in a big group or in small groups, but uh, we need to provide input and feedback uh, from the commission on the potential site locations and public engagement. Uh, this commission was very, very helpful uh, to really design and steer the first public engagement process um, I think it was very successful because of the, in, uh, the input that we received from all of you in our small group sessions. So we want to go and do that again as we talk, as we relate that to the site selection process and then also the public engagement process. Uh, because we really want to have a very transparent uh, process with the public um, and make sure that commissioners are helping us guide that process going forward and then as it relates to the city council process and of course the administrative process we have a lot of pro this is uh, I have to I want to say publicly um, when David presented uh, this chart and got it all on one page frankly um, it, it is uh, really as concise as we can make a very uh, complicated process because we have not only the public part of this, the city council part of this, the administrative part of this, our relationship with the county and how we join the two processes uh, to make sure we're not missing anything in that process, but to also look at the land use itself and the development process and try and envision something that would really pique everyone's interest uh, going forward so that the public can really see the good work that's all been done here. Uh, so having said that, we really would like to use, utilize the commissioners to help us guide that process. So that's what we would like to do in our next small group settings and uh, we would be sending out email like we have in the past to schedule that and work with those schedules so that we can really uh, utilize your expertise in helping us design that. So those are the next steps for the commission going forward. Um, and then um, uh, I'll be turning this back in a minute. But uh, Charlie, do you want to? Uh, yeah, thank you, Palmer. So one question, um, just some clarification on the, uh, your question. Uh, Mary and Gavin's about the site renderings and when those are going to be completed. Uh, the question I have is 
it seems to me that it's going to be really difficult to have those renderings um, completed when we're still having discussions on the number of uh, beds that these facilities will have. Uh, the number of facilities, if, it, if, you know, if we do, if the 500 number is what the city is committing to, and we look at decreasing the number of beds in the facility, we may have to include an additional facility. Um, there would also be issues related to the site that these um, facilities would be located at that, we, that may want to be addressed. So it seems that it may be a little bit premature to have a rendering complete when there are still uh, issues related to the size, the location, and everything else. Um, the part I was talking about, Mayor, if I could go first, uh, the part I was talking about was the preliminary draft of the program for the service. Okay. Uh -huh. um, I know that there maybe I and the mayor may speak to that, some renderings that Nexus is doing for that purpose, but that is the concept and the preliminary part of it. Uh, but what we will be dealing with is the draft itself of the programming of the services. And there. So that's that's absolutely correct. I would say that we need a, a number of the services need to guide the location, which will guide the architecture, but so we do have some some draft renderings, those are very, very draft. We don't know at this point if we have um, a square parcel, a rectangular parcel, all of that will change. But what, the questions we needed to answer from a service perspective is, uh, if we are gonna build 250 beds, so that's the one assumption that's made, is that it would be 250, but we can scale that if, if we go in a different direction. If they're smaller, if there's three facilities of, of a smaller number, um, we have to scale those. But we assumed 250 beds and said, if you're gonna accommodate 250 individuals, how much food prep space do you need, how much hygiene space do you need, how much staff space do you need, and what does that look like for a 250 bed facility. So we have very, very draft and really just the programming elements. If you want to fit 250 individuals plus the necessary treatment and programming elements into that facility, how many square feet does that facility need to be, and how many acres would that facility need to um, have in order to be constructed. And so that, those are the service level criteria that then can inform the site selection. So we know, we need to know if we're talking about a half acre or an acre, right? So what, what we're saying at this point is to accommodate 250 individuals with all the uh, appropriate necessary service related spaces, um, you're gonna need about 0.7 acres if you go three stories. Now you can, you know, we can mix and match all of those numbers based on what we hear from the city and the city's public engagement process all of that can be um, adapted, but we did need to make some base level assumptions really to get some full information about what you would need to select a site. Okay, thank you. Uh, I, I do appreciate the clarification. I, I, there, there's a lot of angst, a lot of questions, and I think you know, we need to be very, very clear when we're talking about rendering to what we're talking about. And, you know, the programming element, that makes perfect sense. I, the design element, you know, I think is, is definitely premature. So I'm happy to hear that you know, that is what we're, what, what's being discussed. So thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, are there any other questions from the commission? Anything you would like to address? Yes. My question, I'm sorry, I'm a little slow today. Uh, and I uh, should have brought this up earlier. I'm curious on Matt's perspective on this and also the chief's. Um, so when we're looking ahead, parallel to the continual work on the project, we're wanting buy-in from our broader community, and we want the credibility and the understanding that we need all income levels, all different populations to be invested in our community in this project. And so I think they're looking to what's happening on Rio Grande, um, and I think there's some measurements that possibly could be painting the future perspective that it will be different or look different. I get asked regularly by different neighbors, hey, you're on that, what's the plan? What's the plan? And so I'm trying to be an ambassador and, and share what I can. Um, so my question is, with all the really strong stuff that's been done the last two months to support the, the safety of the community down, down there, um, what are we looking at for the next nine months to 12 months? Because the facilities are not going to be done. 
population is very likely going to grow with other drug traffickers coming to the community. It's, it's not going to be space that and the winter months are coming. And I'm just kind of wondering what our game plan is um, preventatively for winter months and into spring. Do we have we have we thought through or do we have phases that phase out like this will be implemented in the fall, this will be implemented in the winter, this will be spring, like how are we going to contain this? Otherwise we're just going to be constantly paying catch up as the population grows down there before the facilities are built and that um, systems are redesigned. Does that make sense? As far as our efforts, uh, we will continue with uh, narcotics squads and narcotics squads and everything else we have down there. One of the, the, uh, the big things we, we really want to focus on is the community connection center where we're trying to pick the to fix and heal people and actually get them out of that environment. But uh, one thing uh, I think that we should keep in mind is as the winter months approach, um, the problem tends to die out. A lot of people move inside or move back to their homes. A lot of people that are down there on that fifth west area, they actually have homes, apartments, and they, they are not homeless. And so they, the weather that becomes cold and they're pushed back to where they come from. So, uh, but what, I, what gives me such, uh, what I'm so excited about is finally we have direction for Mary Scusi and, and a very progressive timeline that we don't forget that we move, we continue to keep moving forward Typically what's happened, and I've done this 27 years, is we, we put the, the pedal down real hard in the spring, and we try to like, catch up to the, the sheer numbers that are out there, and then we forget about it in the winter because the problem kind of goes away. It's out of sight, out of mind. And so with this commission, I'm very excited about the direction we're going to we'll keep putting our best foot forward to the progress of this event. And Aaron, for the, for the individuals who do not have we're doing our best to get everyone inside. Uh, shelter for uh, all of its uh, misgivings is better than the street. Housing, however, is better than shelter. So not only are we helping people get inside, but we're working diligently to help people get out into housing. We have a very constrained rental market right now, and we're doing our best to get families in into the units which are currently available and help them to get off of their parents or out of shelters and into housing. We have a small number of tools with which uh, uh, to use uh, toward that. And we'd like to expand those tools. Increasing the affordable housing inventory is one thing that simply must happen in order for us to address this problem. Yeah. 
Thank you. And I'd like to thank both Mr. Gale and Palmer for their leadership on this. And it's been incredible. They've been active participants as well as in the Collective Impact Committee. And I think, Mr. Gale, you said it well. But the goal here is to um, reinvent what shelter services and homeless services need to do. to move away from a system where homeless services are pro provided primarily through the emergency shelter system. And that's the shelter, that's the system that, that we've designed. It. But we want to move away from that and move to one where emergency shelter services are available to people when an emergency arises, uh, but that we quickly connect them to services uh, that help to move them out of homelessness and to a position of better stability and self-reliance. And to do that, we know that it's going to require treatment and it's going to require a lot of different interventions. And to do that, we're going to have to have a system that works uh, collaboratively and collectively to meet the needs of the individuals in a crisis. And uh, that's going to take time, and it's going to take uh, an evolution. But uh, I think it's also appropriate, as Gail mentioned, to note that the immediate task before us right now, and for this commission in particular, that's focused on a selection of sites, is to identify those sites so that we can move forward in the process that um, we are engaged in with the state legislature, where funding is generously been offered and is on the table, that we can move forward with the selection of those sites and then move forward with um, the realignment of our system, starting with the realignment of the delivery of emergency shelter services. Uh, thank you, Mayor. And um, I, I want everyone to understand that every issue that's been brought up today is being addressed. You know, we are um, at the table having discussions on housing and how to supplement the number of housing units that need to be available. Those discussions are happening both on a private level and a public level as a partnership. Uh, we are also working diligently on the addiction issue and the criminal activity that comes with that. Um, so even though this is a site selection commission, uh, there are members of this team that are working on the other elements that need to be dealt with in this process. And yes, it does take time, but everyone is staying committed. Everyone is still at the table. We are all still working together. There is still a very strong partnership, both at the state and the city and the county level, to create a model that can be replicated throughout this state. Uh, there are other governmental entities in this state that are looking at doing their part to create resource centers. So there is a lot happening um, and we are um, doing our due diligence. It does take a ton of work. I can't even begin to thank my team enough and the amount of work that they put into this. There isn't a day that doesn't go by uh, where we are not committing significant city hours on this issue and all of the issues that come with it. Um, and the county can say the same. Uh, we are working very hard. So please know that your concerns are going to be addressed. It may take a little time to resolve them the way that you believe they should be resolved, but there is nothing going unchecked and there is nothing that is just sitting by idly uh, on any of the issues that have been raised today. So thank you for being here. Thank you for participating. Please stay involved. And if you have questions after this meeting, you're welcome to talk to any of us. So thank you again for coming.